Hi, I'm Duffy O'Craven, uh, working as an independent consultant for a company called Quinda. Uh, we look forward to giving you some introduction to Spicy and uh, from some perspectives I picked up working on it as a consultant. Uh, the talk I'm about to give is definitely going to be esoteric, uh, technical. Um, if you hire people to do this kind of stuff, you can totally uh, tilt back your chair and lower the brim of your hat. It's not going to be the stuff you need if you're uh, supervising Spicy, but if you're the person who's actually in the editor writing the code, you pretty much need to know all of this stuff. So tune in if you're uh, going to be a parser writer or you might be. Um, I've divided the things I'm going to talk about today into just a few topics. Um, there's a vast, vast sea of information about Spicy that you're going to pick up as a spicy writer, as a parser writer. Um, I knew going into today's Seek Week that Benjamin Banyer would be doing the earlier discussion and he and I chose to pick two lanes. He was going to give the presentation that was for a wider audience and that would give examples of the basic syntax of things, um, talking about how to do the sort of soup to nuts from uh, writing your first parser and uh, for your first lines of spicy through integrating with Zeek and seeing events and demos. Um, I'm taking the opposite end, um, things that I learned which you won't encounter for a while or which were especially tricky, um, things that are deep down in the weeds of the code. Uh, so I picked out these three topics. Um, over time, I suspect I'm going to do more things. I might even call spicy parser best practices a kind of series and do a series of these. Uh, but today, just talking about uh, framing the next step, uh, the things I learned about doing ASN parsing and the things I learned about avoiding throwing an exception, which brings spicy to a halt. The framing is actually probably the most important thing to get right. Uh, it means that you'll get the most reuse out of your code. It means that you're going to deal with the issues of the protocol in the right place. Uh, it, spicy has a, a type system um, calling any given user defined type by unit and calling everything else a function. Um, so if you have any concept like a packet or like a frame or like a, a, a header, um, those are things that are appropriately made into units. And as you write the code, you should pick up what each of those is going to be, define a unit for it and deal with it as a unit. Um, you can pass units from one to another, you can make references to them. As you'll see in the hierarchy, um, when one is a parent of another, you can pass the parent pointer and you can modify the parent from the child, those kinds of things. The experience I've had is uh, the, the protocols that human beings have created tend to start with a binary. Everything else beyond that is a variable length and is able to be picked up by uh, either looking for the line feed or looking for the specific with a regex. There are three things that I found that were the primary ways of picking up a frame. Um, the PCAP packet example there in blue shows the, the one that you use the most. Um, you can pass it in from, from where you've called it from, your, from its parent. Uh, if you know anything about it, like the ethernet type or the DL type, um, but you're going to send, see this, this paradigm of um, a parenthesis followed by double close parenthesis, open close bracket until zero in your code a lot, um, if you have any kind of a sequence of them. But there's also a couple of other lesser used ways to frame it. Um, you can parse at a specific place in the past, um, which you might have encountered, but not been able to detect that that was the start until further on in the parse. And then there's another parse from, which is also extensively used. As soon as you know both the beginning and the end, it's good to call parse frame. The, the insp inspiration for a place I found I could use parse at uh, was in writing a disassembler for Intel IA64. Um, it started off with those 256 opcodes, which if you've been programming as long as me, I'm 40 years into this. Um, it used to be that there are only 
a single 256 page of the Intel opcodes, but then they did the extensions for the 32-bit and they did the extensions for uh, vectorization and the extensions for uh, dealing with matrices. Um, so they dropped 66s on the fronts and F2s and F3s. And then after the OFs have been around for a while, they dropped this OF38s. Um, and the result of this is that oftentimes you're partway through the instruction before you find out that the pre-header bytes have encoded some of the extensions that you've already passed over and thought you had not seen because um, they put OF38 and OF3A as little bit patterns inside some of the extensions. Um, so here's an example of code that I wrote in to give it a, a sense of where those things show up. Um, they, the parsat needed to go back to the root of the instruction after I found out that, it, it, that because of the extension, it was going to contain an OF or an OF38 or an OF3A. Um, parsat can only be used backwards. Um, it basically just means that you thought you had consumed some of the input, but you've decided you're going to go back and go over it again. And it, it, it's pretty rare, but um, it's good to know that you don't have to take things all in straightforward order. Parse from, I put an example there down at the bottom. After you've gathered something up, it, especially if you're going to want to use it in a different data type, um, it's possible to just parse from it again. Um, this was used because, for instance, when I'm just uh, outputting a disassembly, I want to put the raw hex bytes over at the far right. Um, so I parse from all the usable pre-bytes again, and, uh, and then I'm just going to output them as hex characters after I output the instruction that I pick up from disassembling. The other area that I found really intellectually <laughs> tracking, uh, challenging and uh, engaging uh, was in dealing with the ASN1. Uh, I was, came from a BACnet background, the BACnet protocol for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, everything they've done uh, was ASN1, except for the very beginning part of the network layer. Um, so it, like many, many human designed protocols um, was designed so that the recipient can go one pass forward, linear, um, but has a whole lot of optionality, has a whole lot of branching flexibility. And so they adopted what's been called uh, tag length value. Um, if, if you hit any of these hierarchical protocols, you'll hit the tag length value. It's very, very common. Um, it allows for optionality because any tag number which is not observed is that's just absent is one with the optional. It, it, it encodes pretty uh, efficiently that way. Um, it doesn't force any fixed lengths because every tag is accompanied by a length um, and can go on for that number of lengths. Um, and it just supports any data type. The tag is usually data type specific, but as long as you have the length right, you can skip over parts you don't need without ever even knowing what the data type was. But because of this tag length value, you get a little, an arrangement like this. This is a typical specification of a ASN1 or a tag length value protocol. Um, one of the key things to notice about it is they don't just keep going up in the numbers. Um, they go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then when they come up with another construction, they decide, well, go back to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This one goes this. The bottom one at the bottom actually goes right now up to, I think it's 253. <laughs> so, uh, so, but they keep reusing the numbers. So hitting a tag is not a specific place in the hierarchy of what you're parsing. It is only a specific place in the hierarchy of the thing you're parsing. So you can't just write code that looks for a three or looks for a four. Um, you end up, here's another piece of the code. Um, you get to use a generic tag length value item, and the parent is another generic tag length value item. You get to write recursive code, but you don't get it entirely without uh, needing to keep track of the structure. The, for instance, on this three um, from the previous page, it's the array index. Um, if I hit one, I don't care. Um, I, was just, I was just interested in the property value in the four. Um, but I can't throw away all the threes because if I wanted the polarity, um, the, the last item on the previous page, um, that was a three. So I can only throw away three at certain places. So as I come into this code, um, I look for the three and if it's there, I 
have this uh, set of cascading ifs so that I can move over it without caring. Um, and then I come down to the switch statement where I'm going into the property value. Um, and the thing I want is not the value, but the value of the value. Um, so get grandchild is a typical reusable construct you'll find when you're dealing with TLV as well. You get to pass it how much is remaining because it itself might still be a recursive data structure of TLVs. So the, the length remaining uh, just finally tells the deep cascade uh, when you finally have used up that tag and get on to the next one. So the code you write when you write for the recursive descent, you will deal with each level since the tags will get reused. Uh, you can't just uh, switch on the tag number or even if you make it an enum, you still can't just switch on it. Um, the precise keeping track of your recursive depth and the amount that you need to jump back up when the length runs out, uh, as, as with all recursive things, um, every possible permutation of the fractal is possible. So you will meticulously keep track of when the length runs out and, you'll, and your call stack recurses back up. Um, another thing about SPICY is that they haven't precisely defined how deeply you can recurse. The code you write, so far, the code that I've written so far, um, was working on data that never had to recurse down near the 40th level. Um, and that's a kind of rough number when I ran an experiment. It's the stack size for SPICY can do about 40 levels. And we're going to probably tighten that up, come up with a very precise amount that SPICY can handle in recursion. Another is uh, when you're dealing with the, the recursive hierarchies, you won't always know the length of the whole um, because ASN has a mode where it just ends a double zero for a unannounced length. So you're actually going to have to write code which has to deal with the remaining length or the double zero if you're handling real full ASN. And another is uh, I gave you a, a, a mention of the generic TLV item and then passed it parent length remaining. I can't actually pass the parent into the generic TLV item when the parent is also a generic TLV item. Uh, because the, the signature for such a subroutine call is infinitely long. <laughs> uh, there's a good chance that the spicy will get to evolve to the point where they'll truncate recursive calls to oneself for the signature. But right now, you pass the pieces of the parent instead of the parent itself. Another interesting part of the code that I need to write for spicy so far has been that it wouldn't do to throw exceptions. The exceptions were anticipated, and it looks like they're going to be supported. Uh, but right now, throw a conditional before everything that might throw a spicy exception in order to keep spicy parsing. Um, it just it has error once. It has an on error handler, but that is a terminal on error handler. Um, there are several areas that were clear that I needed to bulletproof um, anything that was user input, which could be of unknown or indefinite uh, content. Um, I needed to validate, but also I needed to deal with deal hitting any limitation of the spicy data types, um, since they'll throw as well. If you hit any of their limitations, they use safe int. And so if you hit the limit of the int, it's going to throw an exception. And another is that everything about a protocol standard is kind of communitarian. It's not actually a limitation on what could happen. You have to code for all the things that could happen. Um, one of the ones I dealt with was the BCD time and time zone. Yeah, it's uh, coded in one digit per nibble. But I'm pulling out halves of octets. I'm buying, pulling out four bits at a time, and I'm trying to assemble. Uh, a date. Um, at the end, I wanted uh, a date since the epoch. Um, and so I actually had to go through and check that nothing in the encoding um, was not actually a date since the epoch. Check for the zero in days of the month. I checked for zero in the months. Check for days that are shorter than months that are shorter than 31 days. Um, the more esoteric ones around February 29th, which only occurs in every you're divisible by four, but not divisible by 100 unless it's divisible by 400. 
Um, even in years when there is a 29th, you have to check that the 30th and 31st weren't specified. Um, all of this in pursuit of trying to create a date since the epoch, since you actually have to pull out a valid date or you should not even attempt to calculate a date since the epoch. Um, they, I am certain that future spicy will have a raise cache and, and it will probably resynchronize on the next packet or on the next connection. Uh, they have a thing called um, amp sign synchronize. It's not clear for sure what it's going to synchronize on, but there's going to be some things that it can synchronize from some exceptions. And when you're trying to make no throw code, you actually can't just take scattershot. You really do need to work out through every possibility um, to make sure. Um, it's, I've never found in the current spicy that's out there without any catch handling, any way to recover from any exception. Um, I mentioned in kind of offhand there at the beginning, at the beginning of this section, uh, limitations in spices data types. Uh, for instance, right now we're using number of minute nanoseconds since the epoch in a 64-bit int. Um, when I was dealing with my dates as little pieces of four bits in the half byte, um, I actually transposed one. And so instead of finding uh, year 2013, I was, or uh, 1990, I was finding 1919. Um, in 1919, uh, which is only uh, 7,000 years from now, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, it exceeds the highest possible number of nanoseconds since the epoch, which happens in 2554 in July. So the code that I had to write had to actually have the special case that I don't make an attempt to call time since the epoch if I'm exceeding 2554. So I, did, I hope I've given you some sense of the kinds of things you'll see when you're deep in the code of spicy, um, things you'll think about, things you, if you've seen this talk, you'll come in better prepared for. Um, I thank Corelight for giving me the exposure to spicy. I've had it since February. It's been delightful. I really, really support the technology. And thanks Amber for being my main connection here. Robin for <laughs> being so brilliant in creating spicy and giving me all the guidance of how to use it and Benjamin for fixing all the bugs that I've reported. Uh, if you're looking for a spicy parser coder, I am enjoying this technology very, very much and would be happy to do it. Thank you. <laughs>